Uh, good evening. Thank you for joining me for tonight's talk on antiques. Coming to you from the Brass Armadillo Antique Mall in Denver, Colorado. I have the great pleasure of having uh, as guest someone that many of you already know, Vern Platon, who has done several shows with me uh, where he's talked about his extraordinary collection of antique pocket watches. What Vern has picked out for us here tonight is uh, a co that part of his collection which are private label watches. Uh, so we have a great variety uh, and uh, Vern's going to go through and discuss each one in turn. He'll tell you what he means by private label, how that might differ from retailer, and um, as always, uh, if you have any questions about any of these things, come on and uh, uh, send us a, a message and uh, I'll get back in touch with Vern and ask him if you have a technical question. So Vern, welcome back to the show. Thanks Gary, and it's good to be here again. I'm glad to have uh, anyone and everyone out there watching. Uh, private label watches are uh, the topic of today, but it's, it's not an area where you're going to come out of this uh, uh, being a genius, knowing everything there is to know about uh, private label watches, but I'm going to let you know what they are. And I, the main purpose is to point out that as far as interest in watches or collecting, it's a field where uh, it adds some depth to a collection. Uh, watches that wouldn't otherwise be collectible are collectible because of uh, b because of the provenance that's on them or the private label. A private label watch was made by any watch company. Could be an American company, could be a European company. And other companies, could be a railroad, could be a department store, uh, Macy's, uh, Bloomingdale's, lots of companies like that had their own private label watches that some of the American watch companies would make for them under their own name. Uh, Montgomery Wards and Sears are two of those that are very prominent. Uh, some watches were uh, made for with a private label of a jeweler or uh, you know a, a watchmaker's shop. Some were private labels because they were made for the ultimate customer, the buyer. And he may want his name on it. The reason jewelers might do it was for advertising, for a little bit of prestige. You know, in other words, they might be selling a, a Waltham watch in Massachusetts and uh, have having their own name on that watch. And everybody knows the Waltham uh, or American Watch Company in Massachusetts. Uh, it would just give them a little prominence. And I I know I've had I've seen advertisements from jewelers where they would uh, be advertising that uh, with their name on the watch if if the customer would was to lose his watch sometime uh, people could see his name and address him being the jeweler and uh, return it to him so with that being said we'll start out the first watch we're going to look at is an uh, Elgin watch made in Elgin uh, Illinois and it is an old key wine key set and uh, this watch is uh, well known although there was only a few hundred of them made uh, because there's a documentation and a letter going from uh, the Pennsylvania Railroad to Elgin saying what good luck they'd had with BW Raymond grade watches and ordering some more this was one of those that was ordered and in that arch overhead, it says Pennsylvania Railroad Company. And on the back, uh, in the movement, uh, it merely says B.W. Raymond. The other watch, or the next watch, is a, a ball watch company watch made in Cleveland, Ohio, or named Cleveland, Ohio. But Ball was a uh, watch inspector for over 286,000 miles of track. Uh, mostly east of the Mississippi, and uh, was kind of a self-promoter, so he started having the watch companies make it watches for him. So anytime you see a ball watch, you're looking at a private label watch. This watch is uh, not just that, but it's a ball and company watch. It's a first production run of a 999 grade made by Hamilton. The 999 designation was for uh, a New York Central locomotive that uh, broke the land locomotive speed record of 100, 
was 112 miles per hour that it was able to run. This watch is before uh, Ball's patents were even uh, out in 1896. There was, uh, I think, a run of about 79 of these made uh, the first run, and it just says on the bottom of the dial, patent applied for, and on the movement it says uh, pat patented, although it wasn't until 1896. And uh, the other thing that's interesting about this watch is it's made for a jobber who ordered it from Ball. So the jobber was CC Gear in Urbana, Illinois. So here we have a private label of a private label ordered by Hamilton. It was Gear the ultimate uh, retailer? He was the retailer. Okay. And he, he did a number of watches, and uh, uh, he would sell them himself at wholesale and retail hmm. uh, to, you know, to other jewelers hmm. around the area. He was fairly local, but fairly prominent, and did quite a bit of work. On the first watch you mentioned, uh, Vern, who was the ultimate owner of these watches? If the ultimate owner was... Uh, the Pennsylvania Railroad no, in the employees early employees of the of the railroad. No, it wasn't the employees. The, this these watches were made uh, uh, by Elgin for, and that's a good point. This is something I should have mentioned. This watch was made uh, uh, for the Pennsylvania Railroad by uh, the Elgin Watch Company. Uh, in the early days of the railroads, uh, rather than the conductors, engineers, firemen, brakemen, etc having uh, their own watches, the company, the railroad company, would loan them a watch. It wasn't until late in the 1870s into the 1880s that uh, employees began to be required to have their own watch. So these, this was a watch owned by the Pennsylvania uh, and loaned out to employees. Great. Now, uh, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. Next watch we have is again like like Ball, uh, Montgomery was a well-known chief watch inspector for the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe. Uh, this is one of the early watches that he did uh, for the Santa Fe employees shop. These were after employees were required to have their own watches, and this watch, for instance, would have been turned out about 1895, and. On the top, there's a little soap bar that says Santa Fe Route. And on the back in the movement, uh, and again, we'll show it, there's, this is a four ounce sterling case, has case papers that describe that. And it has a very nice uh, movement, also marked in frosted uh, damaskine, Santa Fe Route. The, the grade of this watch is not marked on the watch, but it is a Crescent Street grade, which was a well-known uh, Waltham grade of watch. Are, are these watches that you're showing us here today, Vern, are they for sale? Are you selling these? No, these, these are uh, some of the things that come out of the black hole. I've probably spent more time at the bank vault uh, going through watches and picking some out to bring here than uh, uh, then we'll spend doing the program, uh, but uh, these are, you know, I, I keep these uh, locked up in a vault and get down to see them now and then. Of course, picking these out, I had to play with uh, 50 or 60 others that I didn't bring just for fun. Uh, these are valuable. Most of these are pretty valuable. Most of these are valuable beyond uh, what you would guess. This, for instance, will show you one watch here. Uh, aside from it being a 14 karat gold case, if it was not, that, that's a 15 jewel brass gilt uh, Waltham movement. It is not a high-end watch. That's a 75 to $100, $150 watch. But the thing that makes it very rare into the thousands of dollars is the dial and the hand-painted locomotive and tender. The tender says Dominion on it. This is an early uh, Canadian-style railroad dial, and then in the inside it says Dominion Railways, a Canadian railroad of the 1880s period, and uh, well, there were, you know, 300 of them or so made uh, is all. So uh, that takes you know a $150 watch up about 
you know, well, maybe, you know, 8,000, 9,000 could be. Mm -hmm. Just to give you an idea, because we did that show, as I mentioned, on high-end watches, but we did not concentrate specifically on uh, on these private label watches, but the private label does add dramatically to value, and we'll no discuss question. that as we go. No question. Okay, we just described the Santa Fe route watch, which was an 18-size Waltham. The thing that the Santa Fe Railroad is most noted for was made by Illinois Watch Company, and it's the Illinois uh, uh, made Santa Fe Special which again was ordered by uh, Montgomery at the Santa Fe Railroad and usually has a Montgomery dial. Montgomery is the one that uh, uh, developed the, the dial with uh, each individual second marked around the outer perimeter. And Ball thought that that was ridiculous and too hard for anyone to use. And Ball didn't like anybody else that did anything other than what he did. And uh, so he and Montgomery had kind of an ongoing fight. The thing that makes this watch a little bit unusual is most, there's so many of them, most people think that it's a Illinois grade, but it was not. And this watch, unlike any, most of the others anyway, uh, not only needs to have a dial that has a Santa Fe special on it, but a movement and also a case that is marked that way. And the Sa Santa Fe Railroad cases not always, but often had a uh, fraternal group or some kind of an organization on the back. This has a, a, an eagle and says FOE for Fraternal Order of Eagles. And on the inside, one thing that's a little unusual about this is it's a two-tone movement. And it, uh, inside the case, it does say uh, Santa Fe Special. So this is a triple marked, uh, complete Santa Fe watch, company watch. And because of, uh, because of being marked Santa Fe Special, they're worth some extra money, but because there were so many of them, not as much as some of the other watches and not nearly as much as, uh, uh, as the 17 Jewel uh, Waltham Santa Fe route, although the Santa Fe Special was a 21 Jewel watch. Next watch we have in an open face mock box hinge case says Vesey, Boulder, Colorado. I haven't turned up a jeweler's name from there, so I'm guessing this watch was made for the ultimate customer. And this is a, a Hamilton movement in there. The next watch, uh, th this watch is marked on both the case and the, move, or the dial and the movement. This watch has only the Illinois uh, Old English uh, script and the Gothic uh, Arabic numbers. It is a, a bun grade, Illinois, and it says made expressly for E.C. Crothers for railroad use on the back. Again, the bun grade is not made, and in doing private label watches, you're often going to be looking at a watch that does not give you the maker's name. You have to know what it is or be able to find it from uh, from the serial number and the, uh, the uh, configuration of the plates on, on the movement and whatnot. But again, this was a very, uh, he was a very uh, well-known uh, railroad watch inspector and did a, quite a few private label watches of his own. The next watch is what is often described as a Canadian railroad watch because it has the 24-hour dial with the, uh, with the afternoon numbers to midnight on the inner perimeter in Arabic, as opposed to the old uh, Canadian style of having the Roman numerals on the outside. However, this watch is not a Canadian railroad watch. This watch is marked Schwenken Brothers, Leadville, and Pueblo, Colorado. So you have two towns. Uh, and something else that's kind of unusual about it is the, the bow. Uh, it has these two little knobs there on either side that went kind of like a bar over crown case. When you have that up, why well, you can't turn that crown. This happens to have a train on the back. Mm -hmm. And another Leadville watch, 
uh, says MUN special on the dial, and on the back it says Leadville, Colorado. This is a Seth Thomas, and it's gorgeous, uh, wonderful two-tone movement, 17 jewel from the 1880s. I've also seen uh, MUN uh, uh, named watches uh, with a Denver address rather than Leadville, and that holds true with a, a number of these watches. In fact, the next one is such. Uh, Freshman in, Cripp in uh, Cripple Creek also uh, shows up in a couple of other towns throughout. This is, uh, again, a, you know, a period watch of the heyday of Cripple Creek when it was a, a, a mining boom town. Now, you've collected um, a lot of these watches. We live here in Colorado. The, are, are watches, say, from, that are private label from Cripple Creek, or, are they collected by people elsewhere and do the, the, oh, or yeah. Leadville? And oh, yeah. Are they, are, is it because they come from Colorado, is there anything special? Is there a value factor in, involved? Abs absolutely, and there's more in Colorado than there would be in Washington or New York, but uh, that's, that's part of the fun of collecting private label watches, is getting watches from various parts of the country or from your own. I, I used to sell these when I would get them, and, uh, my lord, I've so sold a Del Norte, a Cripple Creek, Fe uh, Georgetown, and I've never seen another one. So That's when you regret it. Yeah, I <laughs> sure do, but especially since I've started doing it. Another town that's hard to find a watch from, and another jeweler who I've seen also uh, with an address of Cripple Creek is F.C. Hooper. And this watch is in an eight ounce uh, coin silver case Wow. has a fancy dial, was made by Rockford, and it's marked uh, H.C. Hooper, uh, Aspen, Colorado. Mm. And a massive, massive case. Yeah. Wow. Next watch is in a multicolor gold case with an elk on the back, and it is marked Butler and Company, Trinidad, Colorado. Probably of all the Colorado uh, mm private label watches uh, of people that were railroad watch inspectors and the butlers were in Trinidad back in its mining days. Uh, Butler is probably the, the easiest name to find. The thing that's unusual about this other than the fancy gold case and the fact it's a private label is it's a Hamilton with a two-tone movement and that's quite unusual although it wasn't unusual for a uh, for a Butler private label watch to have a two-tone movement. Are all of these men's watches? Yes, yes. Uh, there was quite a distinction back then. Women's watches started with about a 10 size or eight. Most common was uh, going to be a six size watch or uh, an aught size clear on down to a three aught. Yes, a 50 cent piece on down to uh, a quarter size. Uh, I, I learned early on not to call the small watches uh, women's watches though. The first ones I sold at a general antique store or show was to uh, two women who were buying them for their husbands to wear in their office suits and then the next two I sold were to men buying them for themselves for the same purpose. <laughs> so things have changed but yeah. In the day, why uh, women wouldn't have a watch like this. Mm -hmm. Next watch is made by Aurora, and you don't see many Auroras, period, much less private label watches. This one is marked Sam Betters on the dial, has the gold uh, Louis XIV hands. The movement, however, is a wonderful snowflake crosshatch uh, two-tone uh, movement uh, which was a very well-known Aurora uh, Damascene pattern, and it is marked Kreitzer Brothers, San Antonio, Texas. I've seen Kreitzer Brothers from other uh, towns, I think uh, Paris, Texas, as I recall, and uh, I have a friend uh, who may be watching this, Don, if you are, well, I know I have some watches from uh, Lufkin and Paris, that are uh, pretty near you, I believe. Next watch is also a Texas watch, 
but it's more than a Texas watch. And I think it's the first one we're going to show that is a European watch. And this is a Patek Philippe. And this goes back to the uh, mid to late 1880s when Patek Philippe was first uh, uh, getting established in the U.S. Uh, it was very, uh, it was a very early customer of uh, Henry Bohm, uh, uh, later became Bohm Allen that we're still familiar with there on 16th Street. And uh, Patek sold quite a few watches to, uh, to Bohm and Bohm Allen. Uh, this watch, however, is a private label in that on the, on the dial it only says Patek. On the, on the movement it says Patek Philippe, but it also says Nephli, Dallas, Texas. Now Nephli's jewelry store was uh, right on the main street uh, in dead center of Dallas. He was in business from 1879 to 1901. So again, it's quite a, quite a little collector piece. What, what carat gold would that be? This is 14 carat. It's 14 carat, mm -hmm. even though it's Patek Philippe. Yeah. Now, what's the value of that, would you say? Oh, uh, that's not the most valuable watch. Uh, it's probably six, 7,000 at the most. Okay, thanks. Next watch is also a Denver watch. J.C. Bloom, Denver is how the dial is marked and the movement. It's a fairly generic 17 jewel Swiss movement, nothing fancy about it, a gold fill case. What is different other than the private label is probably the jeweler uh, encrusted the bezel in uh, gold nuggets. So these would be uh, probably 22 to 24 karat gold wow. around the perimeter. Wow. Next watch is a watch with a lot of talking points. This is a Hamilton and not a particularly high grade watch like we were talking earlier. Yeah. This is a 975 Hamilton. It's a, it's a 17 jewel watch. It's a good watch, but it's not a high end watch, except when you add a case encrusted with diamonds and multicolor gold and uh, the fancy dial, which again is unusual for a Hamilton. And it's marked Anna Silvera, 72 Jackson Street, uh, San Francisco, California. She was there along with Shreve and some of the other uh, San Francisco jewelers from the time of the gold rush. Uh, she was uh, one of the first and only watchmakers, not just in uh, San Francisco, but anywhere in the West. Uh, she, she has various addresses that show on her watches. And besides being a watchmaker, she was a jeweler. So she had the jewelry store. She also had a restaurant and a bar and lounge all upstairs or downstairs or next to one another. And there was also a whorehouse involved with it. So this is Madame Anna Silvera's watch. And these watches were given by her to uh, good customers, uh, well-placed uh, politicians and et cetera. And they're, they're not obscure. They're, they're fairly easy to find if you want to look for them. I've seen many of them, and I have yet to ever see one of these watches that's well worn. I think people were glad to take them when they were given, but it's not the kind of thing you show off to your wife or your mother or uh, uh, maybe the, your partner at work or anything, <laughs> yeah, because they know where you got it. <laughs> so you don't, the, the design of this is not a unique design. Have you even seen these with this, with this kind of workmanship and diamonds? Yes, not all of them have this kind of a case, very few. In fact, more of them will be the fancy dial, but a gold fill case. Mm -hmm. Now this one also has a California gold quartz chain hmm. with it, so that adds to the value there too. Yeah, really interesting. Next, we'll go to uh, a watch that I think was probably made for a customer. It's marked on both the dial and the movement, Hill, New Orleans, Louisiana. I included this watch because it's a wonderful case. Again, a multicolor gold fill case, butterflies on it, diamonds on it, uh, shield with nothing on it, which is unusual uh, when he's got uh, his name on the dial and the, uh, and the movement, which is an old Columbus movement. 
And this movement would have been before uh, 1893 when Columbus went into receivership and Gruen, the primary impetus of the Columbus Watch Company, uh, was forced out of the company, went to Cincinnati and started the company we're all familiar with, especially for wristwatches like the Curvex and things that, uh, that Gruen was well known for up into the 1950s. Yeah. But it just shows you the regions, you know, private label watches seem to come from everywhere. Mm -hmm. Again, another very prolific watch, uh, 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 watch was be marked N. Gamsey, New York. And they were always marked, like this one is marked the globe. It could be the American leader, uh, 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 Miss Liberty, any number of things are on them, always of a patriotic bent. But uh, Gamsey did many watches. They were always uh, uh, either a fancy dial or fancy hands, like these Louis XIV hands. And they always had a two-tone movement, or I can't remember seeing one that didn't have a two-tone movement. Again, this movement is a nice movement. It's a P.S. Bartlett grade Waltham movement. It's not marked P.S. Bartlett, but it's marked, uh, you know, just with N. Gamsey, the globe. But that would be a, a Bartlett grade watch and wouldn't be worth a whole lot except for the private label, even with the two-toning on it. We're getting pretty well through these. This watch is interesting for a number of reasons. This is a keystone case. It's a nickel case, but it's about the fanciest nickel case you're ever going to see. It's marked Harwood Special on the dial. And again, for a Hamilton to have a fancy dial is quite unusual. And on the inside, it's marked uh, again Harwood Special. And it's also marked uh, Schaefer and Company uh, uh, Bloomfield, uh, Iowa. In fact, I've seen other uh, Schaefer Company watches, I think, I don't know, but they're marked from other towns. Here's a rarity in that not only is it a private label, but it's a sidewinder. A sidewinder is an open face watch with the pendant or the crown at three rather than at 12. And usually a watch is going to have, if it's an open face, it's going to have the crown at 12. If it's a hunter, it has the crown at three. So usually when you see a uh, sidewinder, you're looking at a miscased uh, uh, hunter movement that probably either wore out a hunter case or it was melted down uh, during some depression or other. This watch uh, was made by what became the Hampton Company, but it was uh, in its lineage uh, a step before we get to Hamilton. The dial is, is just marked with the company name, but on the back, on the movement, it is marked railroad watch, and it's marked uh, uh, M and J, St. Louis, that would be Mermod and Jackard. And of course, Jackard was also in Kansas City and Mermod uh, uh, and Jackard in uh, St. Louis also had King involved with them. So Mermod, Jackard and King uh, from time to time. This is an extra heavy uh, coin silver case. And I have seen advertisements for uh, this watch and other grades of the same thing called railroad watch that are all advertised from the factory as sidewinders. So this is the watch that was always uh, meant to be a sidewinder. So there were some factory watches that are sidewinders. Another interesting thing on this watch is you can see the damage on the crystal, but that is from that bow laying against it in somebody's pocket for enough years to do that. While the crystal was a little scratchy and I could replace it, I just think, uh, th that's just too neat to have it that way. So there, on all of these, before you acquire them, you're, you're looking 
you're looking for any replaced parts, repairs, or anything like that, correct? Yes. Because you've got to expect it over time frame that may have happened. Yes. And so what is it acceptable, like it's acceptable to replace the crystal, that would be okay, but what? Crystal would be like a set of tires, or a, a mainspring would be like a car battery. Okay. Uh, there are certain parts that are meant to be replaced. Cases would wear out. People, uh, more so now than 20 years ago, are interested in original cased watches. Now, it would be kind of silly to have, uh, you know, a worn out, beat up original case on an otherwise beautiful watch like the Santa Silvero watch, assuming it was in just a nickel case originally, if that case was all bent and beat up. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, the, the movement and the dial and the provenance of the private label uh, dictates that you dress it up a little and retur return it to uh, maybe not original, but to, uh, to what it probably looked like when, when it was original. Great. You yeah. know, rather than have, uh, you know, something beat up. Sure. So most, most, watch, most watch components were meant to be replaced. And early on, watches were uh, not unitized pieces. This uh, Santa Fe Special was one of the first watches that was sold as a complete watch, dial, movement, and case. Okay. Most of them you would buy separately. You would pick out a movement. The jeweler would then show you dials that would fit that movement. You'd pick out a dial. The jeweler would then show you cases that would fit the, the movement. And you would pick out a case and he'd put them together and make a complete watch for you. So all this stuff was meant to wear out, was meant to break. These are uh, porcelain or glass enamel uh, dials. Heat and cold uh, dropping uh, is going to you know, put hairlines and fractures in them. Uh, from time to time, they would need to be replaced. Uh, does that affect value now? You bet it does. Does a less than original case make a difference? You bet it does. Uh, do you want uh, a ball watch with a, a ball model case? You bet you do. And if you don't have it, that, that's going to delete it. Although there were certainly ball watches that were sold initially in other than a ball mark case. And certainly in 1895, when this one that we've just looked at was made, uh, ball was just getting started and the, uh, with Hamilton anyway, and there were not any uh, ball mark cases for Hamilton at that point in time. Okay, thanks. All right, then we go on. This next watch is again an example of a watch that uh, wouldn't be worth much as a movement. It's a pretty nice old uh, high grade for its period of time, 15 joule Hampton movement. And it's uh, got a fancy dial that's very nice. And it's got a private label from Louisville, Kentucky. And that, that starts to add to it. But then you have a locomotive on the front. Mm -hmm. And any time you have that, you have something that's worth a little more. On the back, however, you have this design that I looked at and looked at trying to figure out what it was. And then I saw way up here in uh, print, it says uh, Mammoth Caves. Well, Mammoth Caves is one of the biggest tourist attractions, especially back in the 20s, 30s, and 40s in K Kentucky. So here is a Kentucky private label watch with a Kentucky Mammoth Caves uh, uh, watch case on it. Quite unusual, quite, yeah. quite nice because of the little nuances of the private label and the, uh, the colloquial uh, case. Next watch is a, a, <clears throat> a little different example of a private label. This is called a runic dial. And this was made for Robert C. Conklin. He was not a, a jeweler probably, he was probably a farmer it looks like. And you can see the little idyllic uh, scene of a farm uh, on the dial and on the back, probably he ordered this case too, you have a barn farm scene and uh, it's, a, it's 
kind of uh, X-rated farm scene. The runic dials Th that's, that's are worth again waiting a, for. a different kind of private label. Next watch, and again, uh, we've talked about companies ordering watches, jewelers ordering watches, individuals ordering watches. This is uh, an organization <clears throat> ordering a watch for the uh, uh, centennial uh, exposition for uh, America's 100th year. And the dial says Stouffer, uh, and Henry Stouffer did not make the watch. It's not even marked on here, but uh, Jaco made the watch in Europe. So again, here we have an American celebration and it's not Chinese or Japanese, but it's, uh, it's uh, Swiss. And this watch was made for the Centennial Exposition. And on the plates, you have uh, the plates cut out into a 1776. And that is quite a rare watch. That's really special. The last one we have, again, is the Waltham that I showed you that's a 15-jewel uh, brass gilt watch with the hand-painted uh, locomotive and tender saying Dominion. The, uh, the old early uh, Canadian dial and the, the markings on the back Dominion Railways that, again, is what makes this watch valuable. What's your favorite? Uh, depends on my mood at the time. Uh, What's your you know, favorite right now? I, you know, I don't know. I would say this ball private label of a private label is probably the, mm -hmm. would be the hardest one to find again. Mm -hmm. uh, the 1776 and the uh, Old Dominion would likewise be awfully hard to find. The Conklin, because of the case, would yeah. be uh, awfully hard to find. The Anna Silvera, that's a wonderful watch, but I, I know I could find others of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I, the reason I have my, the watches that I've kept and don't sell cause, is because I like them. There's some here that I probably would sell or, or certainly will sell in time, but right now uh, these are my, my boys and I... I enjoy them and I have fun with them. Sure. And I hope everyone out there has had fun watching today too and uh, letting me gloat a little bit. And I hope I've uh, uh, you know, piqued your curiosity and maybe given you a few items that are of interest to you and that you may be able to use on down the line. And thank you so much for watching. Well, thank you, Vern. Thanks for coming on. Thanks all of you for watching. And uh, this is just uh, one of the several shows that uh, we have done together and uh, D Vern has done a show on beginner's watches. So these, if these, you don't want to start at this level, there's a show out there for beginner watches. And then there are several others that we've done. So uh, thanks so much for coming in. Vern. Happy to do it, Gary. It's always good to see you. We'll see you next week.